approach uh, using the social contract to our last um, talk by doctors Susan Rogers and Shandi Fuller who took us on a deep dive into the historical policies responsible for why we are where we are today with health, health inequities and inequalities and really talked about some concrete solutions toward a more just and equitable and humane society. We are very excited about today's presentation addressing determinants of criminal injustice, which is really a natural follow-up in our series to help us really illuminate the intersections of these two pandemics. We are so pleased to invite back our colleague, Dr. Ruben Miller, who has been a tremendous supporter and an inspiration in the development of our most recent MPH concentration, Health Equity and Criminal Justice. And we're so privileged to have him return just before the release of his new book that he'll be talking about today, Halfway Home, Race, Punishment, and the Afterlife of Mass Incarceration. Before we be begin with today's session, I'd like to proceed with our land acknowledgement statement provided at the beginning of each of our programs. Again, although we are meeting virtually and are repeating the same information, we still think it's so important because it also recognizes that land itself is not just a space that bodies occupy, it is also a depository of culture, story, history, and tradition, all of which have been at risk for being erased. And we all must make a conscious effort to remember um, and share the true narrative of, of our country and how it's evolved. It's also an important way uh, to allow for an expression of gratitude and appreciation, as well as a way to honor and understand the history of specific tribal nations. So our statement today is as follows. We want to acknowledge that Truro University is a site on which the traditional land of the coastal Miwoks, the Sasunis, and other Patwin people past, present, honor with gratitude the land itself and the people who have stewarded it throughout the generations. This calls on us to commit to continuing to learn how to be better stewards of the land that we inhabit as well. Thank you. Now I'd like to turn it over to Professor Deirdre Wilson, Chair of the Community Health for Action Concentration. Good evening. Good evening and welcome again to our fourth session of this year's series. Um, this is a webinar that we host uh, this year and a course that we've had uh, for the past six years. And so as such, there are some housekeeping requirements. Uh, the students uh, know that this is a required course and we request that you complete the uh, evaluations at the end of the session. Our University has a Zoom recording policy, so we'd like to, to let you know that this webinar will be recorded. Uh, virtual attendance in this Zoom uh, session will be taken, uh, and it is anonymous for all of those who are not students. Oops, this is from, there are, there's one session this evening, and that session is uh, with Dr. Miller. At the conclusion of his session, Dr. Miller will uh, be open to question and answers. Please use the Q&A uh, button at the bottom of your uh, screen. There's a chat and there's a Q&A. Please submit all of your questions to the Q&A at the bottom of the screen. We will read out the questions and Dr. Miller will answer those questions for as much time as we have. We are also offering continuing education units for this course through the uh, uh, College of Osteopathic Medicine at Toro University. It's an accredited CEU uh, for a maximum of two um, AMA PRA uh, categories and one uh, credit. If you are interested, please log on to the website that you see there and uh, add the activity code, which I will also add in the chat function. And now we'd like to introduce Dr. Miller uh, at this time. Dr. Miller is an assistant professor in the University 
of Chicago School of Social Services as uh, Social Service Administration. His research examines life at the intersections of race, poverty, crime, control, and social welfare policy. He is completing a book, or he has completed a book, Halfway Home, Race, Punishment, and the Afterlife of Mass Incarceration, based on his 15 years of research and practice with currently and formerly incarcerated men, women, their families, partners, and friends. Dr. Miller has conducted field work in Chicago, Detroit, and New York City, examining how law, policy, and emergent practices of state and third-party supervision changed the contours of citizenship, activism, community, and family life for poor Black Americans and the urban poor more broadly. To capture the effects of crime control and social life in global cities with different public policies, Dr. Miller conducts ongoing fieldwork in Glasgow, London, and Belgrade. He is currently conducting research on the moral worlds of people we've deemed violent and will launch a comparative study of punishment and social welfare policy in the port cities that were most involved in the transatlantic slave trade. A native son of Chicago's South Side, Dr. Miller received his PhD from Loyola University, Chicago, MA from the University of mm -hmm. Chicago, and a BA from Chicago State University. Dr. Miller is one of our favorite speakers as uh, Professor Cummings already mentioned. We are honored to have him again, and we will probably ask you to come yet again. And without any further ado, I'd like to invite Dr. Miller to begin his presentation. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate uh, the, the invitation. Thank you, Professor Wilson uh, and Professor Cummings for always being so warm uh, and, and just being gracious hosts. Um, it's a great honor to be here and to participate in, in this important and timely lecture series. Thank you also to the faculty, staff, and students of Toro University for coming to this talk and your commitment to improving the health and general well being of the people you come into contact with. Thank you also to Sharon Chesney. And, and Professor Namicia Kelly, uh, friends, uh, for working out the logistics of this event. Uh, and, you know, Professor Kelly for just being a, a general support and doing important work and always being there. Uh, finally, uh, to the community members and activists uh, and, and people on the front lines of, of, of these efforts, thank you for spending your evening with me. Uh, and, and, and for thinking together about these most pressing, the most pressing issues the most urgent matters of our time. And so I wanna talk about mass incarceration. And I specifically wanna talk about mass incarceration's afterlife. And my talk today will come uh, from a chapter uh, from my book called Halfway Home titled Center Man. Uh, the book Halfway Home Race Punishment the Afterlife of Mass Incarceration will be published by Little Brown and Company uh, in February. And I'd love to come back uh, to have another conversation about that, but you can always order, uh, pre-orders are up. You can find it at all major bookstores. I guess you'll decide if you wanna do that uh, after I finish the talk. So anyway, so I wanna talk about mass incarceration's afterlife. I wanna talk about uh, the journey home and what that involves and about something that I've called in my work, a supervised society. And the supervised society that we've erected through laws and policies that constrain the lives of people we've come to care about. The premise is simple. We must reimagine the problem if we're ever to change it. I don't think we've yet grasped the totality of it. Let's begin with how we think about the problem. And we'll borrow insight from two of my heroes. The first is James Baldwin. The second is Nina Simone. We'll begin with Baldwin. The year is 1965, it's October. Baldwin is famously debating William F. Buckley, a man called the father of American conservatism. This is at the storied Oxford Debate Society. There's still debates that happen to this day. The resolution of the debate, or what the debate is over. Baldwin's position. The American dream is at the expense of the American Negro. This entire debate is on YouTube if you wanna check it out. Baldwin, of course, wins. Uh, Baldwin always wins. 
I'm not sure that you can lose if you're James Baldwin. But the resolve of the debate, yes, of course, the American dream is at the expense of the American Negro. And there was an expense. There were costs involved in accomplishing, if that's the right word, the American dream. And those costs go beyond the practices of slavery. Though those practices are important, they predate, of course, as we know from the 1619 Project, but from historians who have written before, that slavery predates the founding of our country. And of course, there was stolen labor. Slave labor is necessarily stolen. And there was exploitation. The indigenous lands on which Toro College and the University of Chicago where I teach and, and, and Loyola University where I went and the University of Michigan where I used to work and every other university and every other city are all on stolen lands. And of course there was exploitation. But really for Baldwin, the question was absurd. It's 1965. We had a Voting Rights Act and voter intimidation, a Jim Crow South and redlining in the North. Whiteness, he said, was sustained through Black suffering. And in one of his most memorable lines, he reminds us of the Black condition. Now, leaving aside the physical factors, one could quote, leaving aside the rape and the murder, leaving aside the quote, bloody catalog of oppression, which we are too familiar with anyway. What the system does to the subjugated is to destroy his sense of reality, Baldwin says. In the case of the American Negro, he says, from the moment you are born, every stick, every stone, every face is white. Since you have not yet seen a mirror, you suppose you are white too. It comes as a great shock, he says, around the age of five or six or seven to discover that the flag to which you have pledged allegiance, along with everybody else, has not pledged allegiance to you. To see Gary Cooper, who at this time was a famous uh, uh, actor, killing off the Indians, and although you are rooting for Gary Cooper, the Indians are you. This is Baldwin being Baldwin. William F. Buckley was simply overmatched. I and many others think Baldwin's mind is exquisite, but I found the next passage particularly striking. It comes as a great shock, Baldwin says, to discover that the country to which is your birthplace and to which you owe your life and your identity has not in its whole system of reality evolved any place for you. The disaffection, the gap between people only on the basis of their skins begins there and accelerates throughout your whole lifetime, he says. You realize that you're 30 and you're having a terrible time. You've been through a certain kind of mill and the most serious effect of it again, not the catalog of disaster, Baldwin says, not the policeman, the taxi driver, the waiters. It's the landlady, the banks, the insurance companies, the quote, millions of details, 24 hours out of every day, which spell out to you that you are a worthless human being. And it's not that. But by the time you have begun to see it happening in your daughter, your son or your niece or your nephews, you are 30 by now and nothing you have done has helped you escape the trap. But what's worse, Baldwin says, is that nothing you have done, and as far as you can tell, nothing you can do, will save your son or your daughter from having the same disaster and from coming to the same end. The next hero, Nina Simone, it's 1962, three years before Baldwin's famous debate. Miss Simone sits at a piano for a live recording of Center Man at the Village Gate nightclub in New York City. Moaning in the break, the drum and hand clap driving the beat, each keystroke expresses the urgency of the moment. Simone is slender and striking in a white sleeveless gown. Her features feel more pronounced, her gaze focused, sometimes intense, sometimes directed toward the keys, sometimes toward her band or her audience. Her voice full, deep, a compliment to the series of jangling but precise chords that she strums. Oh yeah, she sings. Oh yeah, her voice trailing now, accompanying the chords she plays with an intensity that's directed toward all of us and no one in particular. 
She begins again, her audience on edge. This time, the pitch is a bit higher. Oh yeah, she sings. Now back to the keys. The sound and tempo build and Miss Simone begins. Oh, center man, where are you gonna run to? Center man, where are you gonna run to? Where are you gonna run to? On that day. The song was recorded in 1962, three years before the passage of the Civil Rights Act. Medgar Evers had not yet been assassinated in his driveway coming home from an NAACP meeting. 14-year-old Addie Mae Collins, 14-year-old Carol Denise McNair, 14-year-old Carol Rosman Robertson, and 16-year-old Cynthia Wesley would not yet be blown to bits by a white supremacist at the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham. The same bomber did not yet murder 13-year-old Johnny Robertson and 16-year-old Virgil Ware on the same day. They had not yet been lost to history. But Black life was no easier in 1962 than it was in 1963 when more people paid attention. And it was no easier in Birmingham than it had been in Harlem, New York, or Bronzeville in Chicago. Where will Center Man run and hide to escape the judgment that's all around him? He has sinned, which is to say he has amassed a debt. He must repay it. Les Baxter recorded a show tune cover a decade before where Center Man runs to the moon. But this is a Negro spiritual, one that has been sung in black churches since the turn of the 20th century and whose roots run much deeper. It's a song that should be sung with a tambourine. It's a warning and a call to prayer to get right so the church can go home. And the debt is a real one. The philosopher and polemicist Frederick Nietzsche tells us that the origins of guilt, what he calls bad conscience, come from the material relationship between a lender and a debtor. The debtor, should he fail to pay what he owes, offers the lender his very flesh or the flesh of his wife or the flesh of his child to do with as he will. It's a sign of his free will to offer the one thing over which he has mastery, his body. The lender takes pleasure in torturing the debtor and at the same time sears his conscience. The pain he inflicts will never be forgotten and the debtor and all who see his pain will pay their debts from then forward. This is not far from this, a distinctly American theological tradition where a sin-sick world with sin-sick souls owe a debt to their God. In sinning, they've broken a contract and the debt must be repaid. They must pay with their flesh. This song, Sinner Man, was sung on the tail end of the long 19th century. The survivors of the lash sang it and they would continue to sing it through the coming de Great Depression if slavery was punishing, the hunger and disrespect that followed was nearly as bad. Miss Simone's version was like the one our great grandmothers and great aunts sang. It was a song of fire and smoke strummed on bass guitars and well-tuned pianos, but the hand clap was reminiscent of the washboard and her moans of red lines, cotton thorns and slum clearance. The center man runs and hides on earth. His punishment comes from this world from the Southern horrors that Ida B. Wells famously chronicled and the long trek north and the crack of the police baton in Harlem and Bronzeville and Black Bottom in Detroit that followed. It is the sting of eviction and unsolved rapes and murders. It is the experience of unemployment and hunger all while hearing from preachers and politicians and even social scientists and the do-gooders that move in and out of your neighborhood with their surveys and their cameras and their best intentions in tow, that at the end of the day, it's your fault. Your refusal to snitch or to keep a man happy or to raise your children or to delay your gratification or to shake off the deficits of your culture put you in this position. It's your social disorganization, they'll say, or your disbelief in the legitimacy of law and law enforcement. That is your legal cynicism. At the end of the day, the do-gooders say, it's on you. This version was recorded live at the Village Gate nightclub at the corner of Thompson and Bleecker Street in Greenwich Village. The song's protagonist is the center man who seeks respite on judgment day. The song asks, oh center man, where are you gonna run to? To avoid judgment on that day, on judgment day. He runs to the rock to the river, to the sea, to ask for help. 
And eventually he runs to God saying, please hide me, please help me, Lord. But sinner man finds no respite. The river boils, the sea bleeds, the rock says, I ain't gonna hide you, guy. God says, go to the devil. Sinner man is disappointed. He says to the rock in protest, what's the matter with you, rock? Can't you see I need you, rock? Lord, 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 on this day, but the rock speaks back. I won't hide you, he says. Three times, I won't hide you on that day. So he runs to the Lord. When the Lord refuses to respond to the sinner man, he says, don't you see me praying? Can't you see me, God? But God responds, where were you when you should have been praying? He sends sinner man to the devil. And the devil, of course, is waiting. In this parable, constructed from the traditions of the Southern Black Church, the sinner man knows that the devil will never be satisfied with his torment. That is, he knows that no amount of violence the devil inflicts on his body will ever be enough. So the sinner man cries out, power, power to the Lord, acknowledging what is a matter of fact. The fate of the sinner man is in the hands of the devil, his enemy. Simone's prophetic lyric, like Baldwin's always timely discourses on race and the human condition, better than most capture the social situation of formerly incarcerated people today. They find themselves at the mercy of others, but they rarely find mercy. If we stop for a minute and think about how we think about them, we would admit that we view incarcerated and formerly incarcerated people as pathology and dependence and deficiency and laziness and danger and amorality in the flesh. We see the so-called criminal as all that is wrong in the world and we treat them this way. We know this through our laws and our policies. For the formerly incarcerated living in the post-civil rights era, there are few if any open doors in the labor market, in housing, or even within their families. And just like the sinner man's confession of power, when confronted with the power of his adversary, the devil, the admission of legal guilt is brought about through rejection and exclusion, not fact-finding, not through deep introspection, but by the power and force and weight of the crime control apparatus that comes down upon them and their families. The river boils, the sea bleeds, the rock and God reject the center man. While social service agencies have long waiting lists, affordable housing options are scarce and employers, landlords and their family members reject them at every turn. This is in part due to the proliferation of electronic background checks the advent of what Sarah Legison has theorized as a kind of digital punishment and what Susila Gurusami has described as the quote carceral web, where Experian alerts don't come through our emails and text messages when there's a data breach or when information has been sold to Cambridge Analytica as it was just a few years ago. But when a so-called sex offender moves a few miles away from our home, or we get alert an alert when someone on a violent offender registry moves into our neighborhood. What's worse, their confession does not absolve them from sin, but it instead brands them a digital scarlet letter marking the conventional citizen as a criminal for life and sentencing them to a punishment that lasts a lifetime. Hence Simone's lyric, the devil is waiting. But to more fully capture what life is like under these conditions, we must turn away from our impulse to focus on the violent apparent in the archive, put differently. While we must acknowledge the formal mechanisms of exclusion, if we wanna know what life is like for the wretched of the earth and to more fully theorize social life in the era of mass supervision, we must try to encounter them in a moment of freedom or at least in moments of freedom that they manage to steal away under the suffocating realities and everyday violence emblematic of the carceral conditions. That is, we must map the contours of their increasingly supervised life and note how social and formal legal controls constrain their lives. But if we wanna better understand the worlds they inhabit, we must look at the informal mechanisms that shape their everyday lives. We must turn away from prisons, the courts, the law and the police, if we're ever to see how law and police practices 
get taken up outside the formal criminal justice system. That is, we must move beyond and look outside the criminal justice system if we're ever to grasp its full scale and its full effects. We must observe how the subjects of crime control make life for themselves despite crime control. If we ever wanna fully understand the consequence of crime control in their lives. So how do we do this? We have to rethink the carceral condition. And to do that, we have to first rethink the contours. I'd like to say that we live in strange and marvelous times. We remember the last president was the first American president to come out against mass incarceration. Even going as far as to visit a federal penitentiary, the first sitting president to do so. And that a new president came in and declared law and order. And we know of course that the incarceration rate has risen at dramatic, in, in sort of dramatic ways, in impossibly dramatic ways. From 1972 to 2009, every year for 27 straight years, the prison population increased along with an increase in incarceration rates. This is despite, of course, as we know, a decrease in crime rates so that the two don't, 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 don't sort of happen together. That, that, that crime rate decreased independently of our sort of ramp up uh, uh, in the prison population. We could talk about this. And we know that the racial disparities associated with mass incarceration are egregious. We know, for example, that black Americans are twice as likely to be arrested, five times more likely, uh, five, they have, they're five times more likely to be incarcerated. That is, they have five times, uh, five times higher incarceration rate. We know that they serve lengthier sentences, 10% at the federal level, up to 20% at the state level on average. Uh, and they're more likely to serve mandatory minimum sentences or due to mandatory minimum sentences. This is all because of the same crime. So this is, this is comparing uh, white people and black people in our country who've committed the same crime. They're twice as likely to be arrested, uh, five times more likely to be incarcerated, serve longer sentences, and are more likely to serve them because of, 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 of tricks in the legal code that, that, that sort of signal uh, uh, incarceration due to mandatory minimums. And their criminal justice contact is disproportionate to their reported crimes, meaning that, 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 that despite crime reports, uh, black people in this country, Latinx people in this country, Native American people, especially in this country, are more likely to have criminal justice contact despite the evidence, despite whether or not a crime actually happened in their neighborhood, whether or not they committed a crime, whether or not uh, they were guilty of a crime when they were stopped. And there are clear implications for public health. We know that HIV prevalence is five times higher for people who are held in an American jail or prison. We know that hepatitis C prevalence is nine times higher. We also know that between 12 and 35% of all individuals with communicable diseases pass through a prison. This is a study that was conducted in the mid 2000s. So nearly a third of all communicable diseases that passed, that, 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 that we saw in, in, in our nation pass through a prison. Uh, we know that the population is rapidly aging. We know that there's negative mental health outcomes associated with both people in prison, their partners, children, and community members. In other words, we know that people come out of prison worse than they came in, and we know that their family members, their friends, even people in their communities have worse mental health outcomes once their loved ones have been incarcerated. In a haunting study, they came out in 2012, we learned that for every year someone spent in a prison, now this was in New York State, but for every year somebody spent in a prison, every, uh, every year, they lost two years of life expectancy. This is all important. And this is what it looks like from 30,000 feet in the air. But our focus on prisons and the police have led a curious, yet equally historic phenomena hidden in plain sight, the rise of what I'll call a supervised society. And this supervised society, it's part of a phenomena the European scholars call mass supervision, has transformed the life worlds of the poor. And so that means we have to rethink the scope of the problem. Let's put the prison in its place for a hot second. This will help us. This is a bar graph. This first bar indicates the 2.2 million people who are held in American jail or prison uh, uh, on, on any given day. But we know that if you compare this to the number of people on probation or parole, 
that that number is twice the size of the prison population, that nearly 5 million people are held on probation or parole on in, uh, in, in a given year. If we shift the unit of analysis from the number of people in jail, uh, like from a point in time count to the number of people who get processed through a given institution in a given year, we see that 12 million people it, it cycles between 11 and 12 million, but at its peak, it's around 12 million, about 11.8 million people are annually processed through the nation's 3,000 county jails, over 3,000. But even this figure is eclipsed by the number of Americans who are currently alive who have a felony record. 19.6 million Americans were estimated to have a felony record in 2016. That figure represented one in three currently living Black American men. But mass incarceration doesn't stop at the threshold of the Black family. That is, while mass incarceration targets and disproportionately impacts Black people, this is a uniquely American problem. 79 million Americans are estimated to have a criminal record in this country. We've known that since 2014. This says to me that we live in something like a supervised society. That while prison is important, community may be where the action is. In fact, it is where the action is. This is underscored by recent reports that tell us that every second American, that's one in two adults in America, has had a family member in jail or in prison. This includes one in four Americans who've had a sibling that's gone to prison or jail, one in five children that's had a, a parent that's been sent to jail or prison, one in seven spouses or co-parents have had a lover who's gone to prison, and one in eight parents have had a child who's been to prison. Taken together, the prison itself while doing lots of work in the American landscape more broadly is just one slice of a vast carceral network. So we have to rethink what it means to go to prison, to go in and out of prison, to move in and out of the revolving door since much of the action is in the community. If we pay attention only to the prison, we'll miss how the entire social landscape has been transformed in its wake. A 2014 Bureau of Justice Statistics report tracked 400,000 prisoners who were released across 30 states between 2005 and 2010. There was a 77% recidivism rate for that group, meaning 77, nearly 80% of that group was rearrested within, within, within the period, within the five year period. Half were rearrested within the first year, 33% of that sample was rearrested within six months. And on average, this group had 4.9 convictions. That, that's, that means lots of charges, um, the stacking of charges. But what's interesting is almost half this sample, about 44% of this sample, had been arrested 10 times or more during the study period. And this study was replicated about five years later. And they found when the study was replicated that that the, that the recidivism, not replicated, I'm sorry, they continued to track uh, the respondents for an additional five years. And they found that after an additional five years, the recidivism rate went up to something like 83%. So we have to rethink the scale of it all, rethink its effects. And to understand it, you have to get close. Because what I've shown you so far is the view from 30,000 feet in the air, the statistics, the number by which the very nature, by which their very nature are abstractions. They're not how people live or where. They cannot give an account for how people make decisions and what those decisions mean. They cannot give an account for how people live in actually existing reality. To get to that, you need to radically doubt how we've come to understand things, how we've come to think about people. How we think, how we come to think about institutions and what it is that they do. We began by saying mass incarceration isn't just about the prison. It's mostly about the community. It's mostly about the many millions of lives that are touched by it. But to understand how those lives are touched, 
we not only have to rethink the question, we have to get close. So I ask a different set of questions, not just whether or not you can get a job or what are the health effects of a given, uh, uh, of mass incarceration in a given moment in time, but what is it like to live in a society like this? So what I do is something called a political ethnography. And my subject is mass incarceration's afterlife. And I studied uh, this phenomenon in three cities. Let me show you what I found, but first let me lay out the context. To do this, we have to go back to some numbers, back to some abstractions, but I think they'll put the experience in sharp relief. This is an old uh, screenshot from the National Inventory of the Collateral Consequences of a Criminal Conviction. Um, and this was uh, curated by the American Bar Foundation or American Bar Association. And what they did was counted the number of laws, policies, and administrative sanctions uh, that people with criminal records uh, faced. And what they found was that in 2016, there was something like 46,000 laws, policies, and sanctions that prevented people with criminal records from full participation in the political economy and culture. Well, well, what does this look like? If we go state by state, there are 1,300 laws in New York state, for example. One state, 1,300 laws targeting the same group. In Illinois, where I'm from, there are 1,400 unique laws, policies, and administrative sanctions that target things like acquisition to employment of business licenses, uh, uh, political and civic participation, family and domestic rights, or even access to housing. In California, where many of you all are, there are 1,500 unique laws and administrative sanctions, including 954 uh, that target business, occupational, and professional licenses, 87 that limit political and civic participation, 63 that say where one can and can't live, 64 that constrain with whom you may live that constrain family and domestic rights. What does this all mean? In most states, you cannot hold public office if you have a felony record. You cannot groom dogs or become a barber. You may not adopt or foster a child. You may have to give up your parental rights. You may not live in public housing. Your job applications may be denied. You may be fired or evicted on a whim. Your relationships look fundamentally different. But again, that's from 30,000 feet in the air. This is the legal infrastructure but the supervised society, and I think we've made clear that people do indeed live a supervised life with all of these things that they can and cannot do. But what does it look like on the ground? To explain this, I wanna take you with me and I wanna examine one person's life. I wanna, I wanna introduce you to a man named Jimmy. Jimmy Caldwell is short, affable. He's an African-American man in his mid forties. And I met him at the Detroit Reentry Center. This is a correctional facility that offers residential drug treatment and violence prevention services in the city of Detroit. Jimmy was diagnosed with bipolar disorder uh, when he was in his 20s and struggled for two decades with a crack and heroin addiction. A mental health technician took him off his medications during his prison intake, explaining that he had a drug problem, not a mental illness. Jimmy spent the next eight years in a Michigan prison without access to drug treatment or counseling. This is before I met him, where he paroled to. After doing six of his 18 month parole in a drug treatment program, he was released on the condition that he report to his officer for a weekly drug test, regularly attend Narcotics Anonymous meetings, complete a workforce development training program and get a job. Now, Jimmy was a generally happy man, but he'd break into selling moods. He would cry during his meetings with the parole officer and break into tears during our interview sessions. Fortunately, he had a perceptive parole officer who told him to get a psychiatric evaluation at a mental health clinic. He was diagnosed with bipolar disorder again, immediately put back on psychotropic medications and was ordered to attend counseling sessions once a month. I met Jimmy at the Rosa Parks Transit Center, the city's main bus terminal, and followed him during his first appointments at workforce development. It was February of 2014, one of the coldest days of the year. Jimmy was underdressed. He wore a black Detroit Tigers baseball jacket and a thin worn skull cap. The address was just a mile, just under a mile from the terminal. He was over, uh, and he was overly concerned with my level of comfort. We walked there, but he would crack jokes while we walked, uh, trying to put me at ease. 
He told me no less than five times that he appreciated, quote, spending time with a brother like you and that he was glad to, quote, do something positive. When we got to the address, a Greystone monstrosity not far from Midtown, I understood in a much deeper way why Jimmy went through those motions. The entire building was closed. There was a loose leaf printout taped to the door with addresses for a few, hopefully open, workforce development agencies. But the closest one was nine miles away. This is ironic that the center that was close, that was closest uh, was, was in close proximity to the property where Jimmy was helping to rehab. This was the same place he slept at at night. This is because he did off the books demolition work uh, for, for his former dope dealer. There was no phone number on the printout for the agency uh, that we needed to go to. And Jimmy had run out of minutes on his old phone anyway. He couldn't have called the number if there was one. The bus card that I gave him at our last interview had run out. He was counting on a new bus card for me to get around for the week and the $40 Visa gift card that I passed out as compensation for our interviews to eat and refill his prepaid phone card. He also thought he could have gotten a bus card from the center if it was open, but of course it wasn't, it was closed. If I wasn't with Jimmy, he would have had to walk nine miles to the center or risk missing the appointment. Without the bus card I handed out, he would have to walk miles to the parole office for his weekly drug test, to his AA meetings, or to counseling, or he would have to convince someone he knew with a car to give him a ride. He told me he could be sent back to prison for missing an appointment, and his fears were far from unfounded. Not only did he know men who had been, quote, flopped, meaning sent back to prison, but nearly a quarter of all prison admissions last year were for parole violations just like those, missing an appointment, uh, uh, not being in the right place at the right time. And the price of violation is steep. People who get, quote, flopped have to finish their sentences. And Jimmy had 18 months left on his. Even if a parole officer didn't think the violation was serious enough, to, they could, they could detain him for up to 90 days at the Detroit Detention Center in a unit for parole violators that they called the eye drop. Jimmy's careful work to ensure I was comfortable paid off. We walked back to the bus depot where my car was parked. I gave him a ride largely because he needed me to, but also because I was convinced he was a nice guy in a bad situation. Now, when we got to the workforce agency, we learned that the training classes were full. He could not participate. There was simply no space in the class for him. He was told to put his name on a waiting list and come back next week in case a parolee failed to show up. They didn't give out bus cards to people who were not yet in the program and they could not guarantee a spot for him in the next class. We chatted with the service provider about the opportunities available at the center, grabbed brochures on our way out of the door, drove to a Coney Island, this is a Detroit diner chain, near his work site, and debriefed on the day's activity. He thanked me profusely for the $7 lunch that I bought him, for the $40 gift card that I gave out at the end of each interview, and for, quote, being there for him. There were so few places he could turn to for help that he had to cultivate my trust. Like the center man, his life moved from one rejection to another. But I was struck by this statement about being there. What exactly did I do? The workforce agency that I gave him a ride to was closed. He didn't get into the appointment. And I gave him $40 after he sat down with me for two hours for an interview. This was an exchange. It wasn't, it wasn't a, a favor. How was I there for him? And furthermore, you know, he spent all that time telling me, enjoyed spending time with a quote brother like me, saying that I was such a great guy. But if I admitted, if I was honest with you, if I told you why I gave him a ride to, to, the, to, the, to his next appointment, it wasn't because Jimmy was a nice guy in a hard situation. I gave him a ride because it was February in Detroit. It was cold. I didn't feel like walking to another bus depot, taking some long ride nine miles down just to take another bus nine miles back home to get in my car and drive an hour back to my house. I gave him a ride because I felt like it. He would have made it to his appointment on my whim. This situation speaks to the power of third parties in the lives of formerly incarcerated people. Locked out of the political economy and culture in all the ways that we've talked about. 
from being unable to access employment to being unable to access housing to being unable to 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 uh, to engage in civic life uh, in ways that most people are able to to change the laws and policies that hem them in. Third parties, people outside of the lives of people with criminal records, now have inordinate power over them. Employers, landlords, criminal justice actors and agencies, licensing bodies and government officials, even family members, social service providers, well-meaning researchers who don't feel like getting on the bus. All of us are empowered by law and policy with inordinate power over formerly incarcerated people. This is because of changes in liability law that happened in the 1980s. Basically, what this does is, if you're a well-meaning helper even, if you help a formerly incarcerated person, changes in liability law mean that you can be held liable for their actions. And the ways that that gets interpreted is that if an employer, for example, hires a formerly incarcerated person, they can suffer lawsuits or reputation loss. If a family member uh, allows someone with a criminal record to spend the night in her home and she's renting an apartment or he's renting an apartment, they can face eviction. Now, that, that's the legal uh, apparatus. Social service agencies that offer help to formerly incarcerated people can lose insurance and licensing because of changes in liability law where licensing boards now say, if you help a person who poses a risk, we will no longer insure you. So, so, so this is a pincer move. On the one hand, people are incentivized to ignore the needs of formerly incarcerated people. We're incentivized not to help. And on the other, there's the reality of this condition, which brings about a kind of fatigue. Parents, partners, and children get worn out helping someone over and over again who's unable to get a job, looking at them saying, you're able-bodied, but you're on my couch. This doesn't work. This is a, a, a pincer move. On the one hand, we're, we're incentivized to not help, disincentivized when we help, can be punished if we help. And on the other hand, no one wants to help. The stakes are even higher though. While the stakes are high for well-meaning helpers, the stakes are even higher for people with criminal records. Legal exclusion makes them at once dependent on others for help and in un the least desirable candidates. This is a largely unaccounted for vulnerability where an argument with a partner could mean a bout with street homelessness because you have nowhere else to go. A problem with a coworker could equal the loss of a scarce, scarce work opportunity, a missed appointment, or, 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 or failing a drug test, even failing an alcohol test could mean a trip back to prison. A misunderstanding with a social worker or a case manager or your parole officer could mean you lose a job, you lose food, you lose transportation, you lose access to the treatment you desperately need, you lose counseling or family reunification services, you lose time with your children. People with criminal records live in an economy of favors. We have produced what I call an economy of favors through this transformation of law and policy. This is a new catalog of disaster that fundamentally changes the nature of everyday relationships, everyday interactions between people. On the one hand, third parties have this incredible leverage because we're empowered, they're empowered through legal exclusion. And every relationship is now asymmetrical. So you have an empowered person and someone Who's, who's been disempowered, who are now trying to relate with each other. So much so that exchanges for resources become favors. Things that we would do for everyone else becomes a favor for them because the helper is sticking out their neck to help and is empowered to not help. A favor in this context is renting an apartment to a well-qualified candidate. A favor in this context is hiring someone. The quote ex-offender must put others at ease just to meet their basic human needs. They must prove to them that they're worth taking the risk. This new social arrangement has life or death consequences. I wanna to return to Jimmy's story. 
to highlight this point as we close. I caught up with Jimmy at the construction site where he was doing demolition work for Gary, his current boss, the same man that sold him crack before he went to prison. We hopped in my car and drove to Coney Island, just west of Gratiot Avenue. Jimmy ordered his usual, eggs cooked sunny side up, grits, bacon, toast, so did I, a veggie omelet with hash browns, making sure to check for the curly black hair I found in my breakfast the last time. We drank weak coffee and orange juice, sitting across the table like two old friends catching up on less serious times. Jimmy was happy and I was happy to see him. What's up with homegirl, I asked, thinking about his girlfriend, the one he had been seeing for some time. She was a member of Pastor Smith's church. She had been with him through his last two bits, sending letters and putting money on his books each month without fail for years. Cynthia, he asked with a wry smile, after stints in a halfway house and correctional institutions for most of his adult life, and at the ripe age of 47, Jimmy wanted to be free. Don't get me wrong. She was there for me, Jimmy said, before blurting out, I want me a hot girl. He was laughing, but he was serious. Jimmy was ready to move on. Cynthia was in her 60s, and Jimmy, who was just a few months out from his last bit, wanted to date someone younger and more attractive to him, someone he was excited to sleep with. And besides, he explained, her sister all in my business. This was bad for Jimmy. Cynthia and her sister were close. They were the kind of sisters that shared everything and Cynthia's sister thought Jimmy was a user. He used most of Cynthia's disposable income and he spent nights at her home, but only in between stays and detox in jail. He told me he had been clean for three months, but there was no evidence according to Cynthia's sister that things would ever change. She didn't trust him and told Cynthia to leave him often and she would say this while her sister and while his, while his sister was in earshot on more than one occasion. He told me he felt disrespected. But even this feeling, the feeling of disrespect for Jimmy was familiar. She liked Tabitha, Jimmy said, meaning his middle sister. Tabitha was the one who kept her, her children away from Jimmy. She called him a quote crackhead and cursed him in front of, his, in front of company. He hated how she treated him. He told me they had a birthday party the week before at his mother's apartment. His sister Tabitha knew that Jimmy would be there. This is because he loved his nieces and nephews. This is what he said. He said, she kept the toy, that toys downstairs in the car, Jimmy said, sighing, heavier than before. And she announced this fact to the guests at the birthday party. Jimmy was embarrassed. But this was also an old problem. He got along well with his other sisters. Jimmy was the baby in the family, but he and Tabitha had been fighting since they were little. His mother used to settle their disputes, but he knew that he burned too many bridges and he didn't want to get his mother involved. Since getting out of prison the last time, he can't come around her as much as he'd like. Her mother, his mother's landlord told her that if she let him stay there again, he would be forced to evict her. I don't really come around like that, Jimmy said. I don't want to put her, meaning his mother, in that position. And it wasn't like he didn't need her, but he stayed away from the person who cared for him the most because she wanted to help him. She would certainly let Jimmy sleep on her couch. He was her, he was her youngest child and the only boy. And his mother would have been evicted. The landlord had given his warning. Jimmy knew this, so he stayed away. Tabitha, his sister knew this as well, and she held it over his head. Cynthia's sister brought too much drama, Jimmy said, and it was a kind of drama that was all too familiar. He wasn't really attracted to Cynthia anyway, he told me. He wanted a hot girl, or at least someone closer to his age. He said he was going to leave her. We finished the meal, catching up on his job hunt, his relationship with his parole officer, what treatment was like, and how it felt to be, quote, free. I paid the bill and handed Jimmy the bus card and the $40 I gave out at the completion of each interview before dropping him off at the construction site and hitting the road back home. The next time we connected, Jimmy seemed to change his tune. He was sleeping more often at Cynthia's house, away from the drafty, sometimes damp, almost always too hot or too cold buildings he gutted on the city's east side. And he told me that Cynthia's sister had started to change. They got along better. She stopped insulting him. I wonder what made the difference. He thought it was because Cynthia had a stroke. This was the fifth stroke she had in her lifetime and it moved into what Jimmy called a convalescent home or a nursing home. This made him sad. He was no more attracted to Cynthia than he was a few months before, and now she was sick. 
but he now made plans to get married. Marriage, he said, was the only way he could secure an apartment in her name and make decisions about her medical care. He described the relationship, which he admits was rocky for a while, as a debt. I owe it to her, he said. She stuck with me in prison. I'll stick with her now. Whether or not Jimmy was being honest and decided to stay with Cynthia out of a sense of obligation, or if he needed a place to stay and had nowhere else to turn, the law was in between them. He met Cynthia while in prison. He slept at her house, but had nowhere else to go. If we think about it, we can see how the law changed the nature of his relationships with the two other most important women in his life, his mother Ruth and his lover, Cynthia. He could no longer come around his mother, though he wanted to, and despite the fact that she wanted him there, he was con a convicted criminal. At least that's what his, mother land his mother's landlord said. Ruth could be evicted if Jimmy so much as visited, and there was nothing anyone could do about it. Housing policy made it this way. His girlfriend, Cynthia, loved him, but he may not have loved her. He certainly wasn't sexually attracted. He told me so. He thought that she was too old for him. And Jimmy wanted a hot girl, remember? He had just gotten out of prison. A free man Jimmy wanted to feel free, he said. He wanted to sleep with the woman he chose, not the one who chose him, but he owed her a debt. She stuck with him while he was in prison and he would stay with her now. Even his sister held his many arrests against him, berating him in front of company because he put his mother's well-being at risk. There was tension with his siblings and tension with his lovers and separation from his family. His mother, his nephews, his nieces, whom he loved, separated from his family and in a relationship with a woman he may not love, but with whom he decided to stay, whether it was out of a sense of need or debt or some other moral obligation, the law stood in between Jimmy and the people he felt closest to. I feel needy, he told me, reflecting on his life, sipping his weak diner coffee and finishing his toast. When I asked if his relationships would have been the same had he never gone to prison, Jimmy simply said no. Jimmy, like many formerly incarcerated people living in an economy of favors, what I call an economy of favors. It alters the nature of social life in the American city. It creates a power imbalance. It shapes even the most intimate of social relations. The law is in between us. If we look at this from above now, if we think only about the statistics, we'd see mass incarceration. We think about jail and prison expansion, think about voting rights, employment outcomes, recidivism. We worry about the day's political wins, which are all important, all central, everyone should vote. When we look from below, we see something else though, which should also cause us to run to the polls. We see a supervised society we see a transformed social life. We see an entire economy favors. We see a new kind of citizenship where the unique restrictions, the thousands of laws, policies, and sanctions that target only people with criminal records and the conditions of release, these are a sheet of paper that you get that tells you where you can and can't be, whom you can and can't spend time with and what you must do. That's only for people who've been released from prison, not for anyone else. We also see some rights that emerge from this. If you have a certain risk score, you might have access to a kind of social service. But there's also unique responsibilities. This idea that I must put you at ease. I have to do things to make you trust me. I must give back to society. I must prove that I'm a productive citizen. Just for you to engage in me, with, with me in very basic forms of exchange, the same kinds of exchange that are required for me to meet my basic needs. In order for you to employ me, I have to convince you to do the favor of hiring me, even if I've got qualifications, even if I've got experience, even if I'm the best applicant, you're still doing me a favor if you give me that job because you have a legal right to discriminate against me. It's not simply second-class citizenship. It's not a constitutional contradiction. Discrimination is perfectly legal in our contradiction, in our constitution, when it comes to this group, we create a new citizenship track. And the question for us is, what does this say about the state and nature of our democracy? It's a matter of citizenship and not behavior. You can't treat your way out of this. It's not about whether or not people with records engage in criminal activity. 
79 million Americans have a criminal record. We, 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 we would not say 79 million Americans come from bad families. We would not say 79 million Americans are bad people. 79 million Americans can't control their impulses. 79 million Americans have behavioral problems. We would never say that. But we would say to somebody with a criminal record, stick to it, tenacity and grit, change your ways and everything will be fine. No, this is a matter of citizenship. You can't treat your way out of this. Improving police community relationships won't work, though it's important. Addressing implicit bias won't work. But how do we get free? We have to intervene at the level of citizenship. We have to advocate for law and policy change that reimagines justice. The same kinds of laws and policy changes that are being called for in this moment of racial justice. We have to remember the communities where the action is. And in the meantime, we have to provide a bridge to resources. Most importantly, and equally as importantly, we have to shift how we think about people with records, how we think about the problems as public health professionals, as helping professionals, as concerned citizens, as people with a vote, as people with a voice, as people who have political power when we come together, especially. We have to reimagine the problem so that we can think of new places to intervene. I think we live in strange times. Were we to set every prisoner free today, we'd still live in a supervised society. I've tried to get us to ask different questions tonight, different theoretical questions, different empirical questions. In other words, counting different things, looking in different places, collecting data in different ways, thinking about that data differently. But the question before us now isn't an empirical or theoretical question. It's an ethical question. We live in a supervised society. The question for us is, what kind of society do we want? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Miller. What an inspiring and informational presentation as usual. Uh, it's been very, I think, helpful to put all of uh, our, our criminal justice and uh, the politics in uh, context. Uh, context with you know the the whole movement that we're going um, through right now, and I also believe that it provides the context and humanizes the individuals that are um, encountering um, life after after being incarcerated. And I think the other reality for our students is for us all to realize, based on the statistics that you presented, is that it's more common to know and encounter someone who has been incarcerated and affected by someone that has been uh, incarcerated. Uh, so the othering of um, our citizen, the citizens that have been incarcerated is uh, unrealistic. And um, I'm trying to push those individuals on the, the outskirts of our society and not embrace them. Uh, only serves to hurt us all. So again, I really appreciate you presenting this talk. I've heard parts of it, but then again, it's always uh, enlightening. And so we'd like to open up uh, the Q&A session. We have one question already. And as a reminder, I'd like to invite all of our participants to uh, type their questions in the Q&A link. We'll do our best to have those questions answered. Um, and with the uh, remaining amount of time that we have. So the first question, Dr. Miller, is uh, we know that there is a bias in the legal and a judicial system. Is there any way to account for this bias to estimate how many of those with criminal records did not initially commit crimes? For example, uh, the poor quality of legal defense may lead to someone pleading for a lower sentence when they in fact did not commit the crime. Yeah, it's such a, it's such a great question. And um, I'd like to say that uh, it's a little sticky, just uh, to, to the, the estimation of it. So let, let me give one estimation, which is in nowhere, nowhere near the totality of it. And, and, and actually our uh, Professor Cummins, Cummins and Professor Kelly um, are doing really interesting work with this group. But if we think about the number of exonerations um, since we started counting exonerations. So we started counting exonerations, which are um, people who have uh, through 
great uh, self-determination and through lots and lots of help uh, in most cases with um, legal clinics, uh, lawyers who are working pro bono, uh, uh, public uh, uh, inf information campaigns, letter writing campaigns have managed to prove that they were wrongfully convicted. So since 1989, there've been over 2000 people who've been able through to, through their willpower and through many, many connections and through the strength of, of help from vast networks of lawyers uh, who all often work for free, uh, <laughs> which, which, you know, that's a lot to ask somebody who, who often work for free uh, or who work for much less money than they typically make, uh, who worked to get 2,000 people set free uh, from American prisons. Uh, on average, these folks have spent nine years behind bars for crimes they didn't commit. So that's one measure, that, that, that's one mm, group that isn't anywhere near an accurate measure because of all the trouble you have to go through to prove that um, there was foul play, whether that's through DNA evidence that cost a lot of money uh, to get a hold of, that maybe wasn't administered when it could have been, um, whether that's through um, uh, judicial malfeasance, uh, where the judge has committed some wrongful act toward uh, the, the, the defendant, whether that's through prosecutorial malfeasance, where the prosecutor engaged in 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 awful conduct, what conduct? Whether that's through uh, uh, malfeasance of the defense counsel, where you had a terrible attorney who didn't inform you of all the things that you could have had access to, who didn't mount a vigorous legal defense, the kind that every American deserves and is in our constitution, by the way. Um, and so, through all that, two thousand people have found a way to get free. I'll tell you though that the numbers of people who I keep running into. I keep running into people who've had their sentences, quote, reversed, but who were given plea deals on their way out the door. So they fought. I'll give you an example. My dear friend and brother, Ronald Simpson Bay, um, from Just Leadership USA, he's amazing, amazing man. Uh, and, and anyway, uh, he's amazing despite having been incarcerated for 27 years for a crime he did not commit. He's amazing not because of that, He's amazing anyway, he's brilliant and, and, and uh, is one of the national leaders uh, in this criminal justice reform movement. But as an example, you know, he was given a 50 year sentence for shooting at a police officer and he wasn't on the scene of the crime. He wasn't there. He wasn't there when the officer got shot. Um, and, 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 and the officer said he wasn't there, but, but, the, but the official statement from the police officer was hidden under bureaucratic uh, maneuvers uh, and just hidden as in, we're not giving you access to it uh, and it took a good 10 or 12 years for, for, for that document to surface. And then another seven or eight years uh, for the legal counsel, for him, who, who, who was his own lawyer, uh, to, 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 to get uh, an appeals court to reverse, his, to, to, to reverse the decision. And then another three or four years of legal wrangling just for them to figure out who had the, the power to let him walk out of the jail. It was the most ridiculous. It's the most ridiculous story, but it's it's also a super powerful story, and uh, he tells it better um, himself. Uh, so, there, but there are these folks who who have their senses reversed. But what they said to him was, "We know you've been fighting us for twenty seven straight years, but we'll hold you up for as long as we need to, um, uh, to pr to prevent us from having to admit that we were wrong." So take this plea deal. He says, "If I take this plea deal, I'm walking out, no probation." He said, "Yes." Just give me that plea. So he takes the plea, walks out. They're in trouble because he walks out because he's one of the leaders, leading criminal justice reform advocates in the country. He's an amazing man. Uh, but 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 this is an example. You know these 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 sort of legal maneuvers, these legal tricks um, that happen all the time. And I don't think there's any uh, accurate measures. Uh, there's a law professor, Sam Gross, uh, at the University of Michigan, who estimates based on the number of wrongful convictions, that probably about 4% of the incarcerated population, no fewer than 4% of the incarcerated population is uh, innocent, <laughs> is, is, is his estimate, just using the estimate of exonerations to figure it out. So 4% of 2.2 million, that's a whole lot of people. That is necessarily an underestimate because it's based on exonerations, which take great effort. Um, so anyway, thank you for your question. This is the kind of thing that we need to be counting and the kind of thing we need to be paying attention to um, all people have a constitutional right 
to a vigorous legal defense. All people are presumed innocent until proven guilty, uh, uh, despite, despite the fact that uh, uh, we don't often get vigorous legal defenses, certainly not Black Americans, certainly not Latinx Americans, absolutely not Native Americans, um, uh, Indigenous Americans in this country. And these are things that we have to think about when we think about racial disparities. They're also really interesting and egregious disparities in who has access to the kinds of legal defense that they need. Let me give a shout out while I'm here to the Decarceration Collective. It's an organization of uh, prison abolitionists, just really bad, uh, uh, almost all women lawyers, uh, uh, women lawyers, advocates, um, you know, who have been working to dismantle the criminal justice system. In fact, all women uh, working to dismantle the, the criminal justice system uh, run by uh, 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 a woman, my angel Cody, who's just a, a wonderful person and a friend. She's gotten uh, worked very hard to get people senses reversed, get people clemency, uh, uh, get people exonerated, uh, uh, representing folks she says have been quote, buried alive uh, uh, by, the, by, the, by the criminal legal system. Um, and, and successfully gotten people out, but it takes great effort, great effort, many years. We have several other questions that I'm uh, hoping that we uh, can get you to answer. Um, the next question is, how can we better support people who were formerly incarcerated without providing favors? So, um, and uh, what are some current organizations that are providing sustainable solutions for uh, these communities. I'd like to give a shout out to a new way of life reentry project in LA run by the brilliant, powerful, courageous, and generous Susan Burton. She has a wonderful memoir called Becoming Miss Burton that everyone should read. Um, and what she did was, so she was, um, I'll, I'll give you the, the, the cliff notes of her story. Her, her son, um, was 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 killed by a Los Angeles police officer. He was he was off duty driving a van, hit her kid, and kept going. The police didn't so much as issue an apology to her. And so and so she, she turned to addiction. She turned to addiction, you know, drowning out of grief, and went to prison many many times, six seven six times I believe. And and I think on the sixth time she had been to prison or jail. Um, she got into a treatment facility in Santa Monica, California, a very nice upscale treatment facility and got the help that she needed in Santa Monica and wondered why she didn't get the help that she needed in, 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 in LA. Why didn't she get the help that she needed in Compton? And in, 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 <laughs> like, like, why didn't she get the help she needed in South Central? Like, why couldn't she find help at home? And she developed an entire uh, trauma-informed, holistic, uh, 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 care facility for women uh, who are returning home from prison. Started with one house, has over 10, now has spread across the states, is opening houses all across the country that provide a place to stay, that provide um, a, a space for women to clear their head. They do meditation, they do trauma-informed care. They're social workers and, and access to psych psychiatric services. Um, there's, there's access to health care. She works to help get women reunited with their children. Uh, and then there's also a policy advocacy arm um, that she developed in response to the needs of the women. So she run into problems. So for example, she learned that in California for a long time, women with drug convictions didn't have access to welfare benefits. She's one of the reasons women with drug convictions now have access to welfare benefits because she pushed to change the law and policy in the state of California. You anyway, know, she's an amazing person, an amazing soul. That's just, that's, that's one quarter of what she's done. What we know from the reentry literature is that people need a place to stay. People need substance abuse treatment. Uh, people need jobs. Doesn't this make sense? Stable housing, stable employment and help for their medical problems. And so good organizations like A New Way of Life, I'd like to give a shout out to an organization in Chicago called St. Leonard's Ministries, um, provide uh, wraparound services to treat the whole person. So the, the person is like, but, but those services are not possible without stabilizing people with criminal records. So if you don't allow people with criminal records to access housing, how, how much treatment can you get while you're homeless, for example? How, how effective do we imagine if you're hopping from house, from, from, from bench to bench, or from friend's couch to friend's couch, uh, how, how effective do we imagine treatment might be? We don't imagine it'll be effective, very effective at all. And so by meeting basic human needs first 
and then providing the kinds of services that allow people to be their full selves and humanize them. They don't treat them like criminals. You know, they don't do, don't do uh, random checks of their beds, shakedowns of their bunks like they're in prison and they've, they've done something, like they got a shank in their room or something like that. Like, we're, don't treat people like we're afraid of them. Organizations that do that work and they're organizations like that all throughout the country, certainly in the Bay, certainly, uh, and I named two, one in LA, one in Chicago, but, but there are a million organizations that do really good work. Um, but, but, but those are the things that we know, meet basic human needs and then provide access to things that, that, that are a little bit deeper, substance abuse treatment, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, mental health services, so people can, 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 can deal with the traumas that bring them into prison. I'm answering too long. I know we have more questions, but something like 84, 83 or 84% of women uh, who find themselves behind bars um, have a trauma history have been abused in some way. It's, it's, it's such a staggering number. It, 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 it is staggering. Um, well, well, you, you're not just okay because you walked out of a prison. You, you're not just okay. Everything's not just okay now. Uh, people, people need help. Uh, and, 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 so, and so organizations that recognize people's deep humanity are the ones that tend to be the most effective. And actually, even on objective measures of program success, when we look at evaluations, meta-analysis of evaluations, we see organizations that do things like provide job developers. Those are people who um, go before people with records into the labor market and say, I've got a guy, I'm gonna vouch for him, you know, give him a job. Those organizations are much more successful than organizations that just give, for example, job training. Let me teach you um, how, to feel, how to feel good about yourself when you're, when you're on an interview. Let me teach you how to shake hands or tie a tie or write a resume. Those things don't work at all. Those don't have any efficacy whatsoever, uh, but, but the ones that work are the ones that, that, that provide bridges to resource rich institutions. Dr. Miller, I'm so glad you uh, mentioned uh, a new way of life. It just occurred to me, um, they are doing phenomenal work. I actually have been meeting weekly with one of their clients, okay, name is Janet, Janet Dixon, who served 40 years for a crime she did not commit. And, uh, from what I've heard, um, having been meeting with her for the last couple of months, uh, the, those wraparound services, like you talked about, even for, I mean, imagine a person, again, the trauma of being kidnapped from her home when she was a child and being put in a situation in Los Angeles. Anyway, it's a long story. But again, I think, you know, you were right on when you're talking about that being the place that has to, that, that has to take place. She was actually just released um, and was paroled out, sort of the same circumstances that you talked about, but she was paroled out because of COVID. Mm. So, mm. It was a very unique situation and that's been happening in, in California, at least um, uh, for the, several uh, inmates have been released because of that overcrowding, because of you know having mm. those, 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 those sentences overturned. Mm -hmm. So mm. anyway, uh, I'll just follow up with the next question. Uh, what role can physicians play in changing the perceptions of that trap felons into their cycle of re recidivism? Uh, it's, it's, a, it's, such, it's such a great and important um, question. And uh, I think physicians have a very important role. I think physicians in hospitals. So to talk about the role of, of the physician, um, patient-centered care really does matter quite a bit. I'm not just treating with people uh, with criminal records or people who are marginalized, which is generally, you know, there's, there's a, you know, you, uh, physicians are well aware of the, the quote, white coat phenomenon. Like what, what, like what does it mean uh, uh, for, for people to sort of imbue certain uh, 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 professions with, with a kind of power and authority and, 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 and the importance of that? Well, when you treat people like people, it really goes a long way. When you believe people, when they show up in your office and tell you that they have pains, for example, uh, work to uh, work to humanize the people in front of you will go a long way in not just addressing the needs of formerly incarcerated people, but the needs of marginalized people more broadly. I mean, so we see lots of uh, uh, racial disparities in, in, in medical care. Some of that's because of access. Some of that's because of how people are treated when they show up in the doctor's office. So, so beginning there to, to address the bias um, that's prevalent in all professions, including the medical profession, the physician, uh, beginning from a place of, 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 of deep humanity, looking for the deep humanity in that patient really does matter. Now, for the hospital, hospitals are really interesting places where there have been some experiments across the, uh, the, the country, including in Connecticut, at Yale Hospital, um, at Johns Hopkins, 
um, their hospital. They've been doing some interesting experiments with hiring people with criminal records to work in medical care. And it's gone phenomenally well. So one thing that, that, that the medical field can do is the medical field can think about opening up uh, its doors to people. So on the one hand, the medical profession can treat people with criminal records as if they're not monsters. <laughs> so starting there, that, that, that really does matter. Like, like human, like treat them like your niece, nephew, aunt, uncle, you know, like somebody who's connected to you. Um, uh, get proximate, so says Brian Stevenson. Allow yourself to be close to them and feel some sort of uh, closeness to this, to your patient. Um, uh, uh, helps. It can also cause fatigue, and I understand that. And the, the things you need to do to protect your own mental health, um, you know, so that you don't burn out. So you got to do that. But this group needs needs your help, um, and and also, you know, uh, uh, carries high more all kinds of health morbidities, like 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 uh, uh, are carried in and among this group because of prisons being clusters of uh, 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 health issues. Um, so, so treating them like people, uh, helping them to, to feel comfortable in the setting, and also opening the doors of medical facilities. Um, the uh, trauma unit, the trauma unit at the University of Chicago Hospital does a fantastic job doing group work with, with uh, people who've experienced all kinds of traumatic issues from gun violence um, to, to histories of incarceration, uh, thinking about holistic health care to include um, social workers, mental health uh, uh, technicians of all kinds, uh, social service workers who do uh, navigation and help uh, 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 people navigate uh, uh, access to healthcare services in their communities. Like these thinking, thinking broadly about the role of medical practice in uh, 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 holistically addressing the needs of the community is, is, is a, and including this group in that. Is is, 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 is is a great way to do it. At Yale, they have people called reentry navigators. Uh, that, that These are formerly incarcerated people that help people who have criminal records move up and through uh, the, 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 the medical system, both access and care, questions of work, um, and other things related to questions of reentry. So the medical field, the medical professional, the doctor, uh, and all kinds of medical professionals, and the medical field more broadly um, can play a very central role. Thank you so much. Um, we have quite a few more questions and uh, we're gonna try to collapse a couple. Um, what can you say about how our systems, including school, uh, schools that push youth into the criminal justice system when they should be supported in school um, or through other supportive and creative endeavors? I think that's right. It was, um, you know, it is the same point. I think getting proximate does a lot of work like recognizing that one in two Americans is connected to somebody who's been to jail or prison, remembering that we're not talking about the evil other in the corner. We're talking about your son, uh, father, mother, sister, brother, cousin, friend. You know, everyone is connected in this country just about to somebody who's been incarcerated or, or know someone who's connected to somebody who's been incarcerated. So, so we have to, anyway, long, to, to, to make this, uh, the long story short, the same advice for physicians and, and medical professionals is the same advice for teachers, is the same advice for professors, is the same advice for social service workers. It starts from a place where we, where we recognize our humanity. I'd like to say this really quickly. That means I have to get close to my own pains and my own shortcomings. I have to think and deeply do some deep introspection. I have to think about the things that have caused me harm, that caused me to turn away, that caused me to flinch, that have changed my perceptions of people that I care about or people that I, that I don't so much care about. I have to think about the people, the people who I'm afraid of. I have, I have to think about, I have to get acquainted with myself and my own fears too. Like this is a very important uh, uh, move and this will help me make connections with others. Uh, th there's another really interesting question, um, especially and it's very timely now. Uh, if there was one ballot measure you could add to the state election, let's say every state to address the criminal justice system, uh, what would you add? There's no magic bullet. Um, I would be paying very close attention. One ballot measure. I would ban um, restrictions on, on housing for people with records. Um, I think mm -hmm. if, I, if I could name one, but we gotta be careful too, because, because like there, 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 are, there are reasons, the sensitivities and the reasons you gotta work through this. What I would pay careful attention to are two things. Um, I would pay very careful attention to local elections 
and people's positions on criminal justice issues. Like that, that is as important as a ballot measure on a local election. It's who's in office and what kinds of things they're proposing. So that, that's the local is where the action is. So the, the question about the state measures is a beautiful question because that's where the action is at the state and almost more importantly than that city, I don't know if you all have people called wardens or let me, I'm aldermen or city council members, like those people really matter. The sheriff really matters. The prosecutor really matters. The judges who are elected really, really, really matter. This moment we're all doing mail-in ballots, take the time to do the research. We're all mailing in our vote. Do the research. You got time now. You don't, you know, you didn't used to have time when you stand in that polling place. You know, you see names you're not really familiar with. You know, it's a thousand people on the list. Now let's take a day. Let's take a day and sit with that ballot and think very carefully about these folks' positions. Like I, I think I think that matters. So housing is very important. And then the the part, the, the caveat to that is pay very careful attention to the local to local politics. Okay, so it seems that there uh, needs to be a shift, and I think you've addressed this in, in some ways, um, but there needs to be a shift in the way society perceives formerly incarcerated um, people. How can we convince people to vote in favor of solutions, resources, and programs um, when there's a stigma against formerly incarcerated um, people? Um, you know, and people making claims against using the people's money on people who should be punished. Yeah, that's a really, it's a, these are all fantastic questions. Um, so I would, there, there are a few things that need to happen. So one thing I'm trying to do is like, this is this, this, this chapter that I've shared with you is from a public book. I'm trying to do work publicly to help do that work. There are millions of, there are many people who are doing that work too, um, who, are try, who are sharing stories. The stories matter, narratives matter, uh, I think in important and powerful ways. I hope, you know, this, this is what my efforts have been. Um, you know, we'll see if they matter, you know, at the end of this lifetime, you know, we'll see, see how much they matter. But the, 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 the getting proximate really matters. Brian Stevenson's um, advice to us, for us to allow ourselves to get close, um, th that's part one. Part two, there's a lot of shared, um, th th there's, there's, this, this is one of those issues where people kind of want to get this right right now um, on, 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 Saying both sides is so shallow because politics is much bigger than Democrat or Republican politics, but but it's kind of not too in our country. Right? It kind of is like that kind of is actually the only game right now, but it, but it is shallow that that's the only game. However, um, you know, people on either side of the aisle um, are interested in getting this question right, you know, and they're talking to each other. Um, in fact, you know, I'm, I'm, I mean, it's, I, prob people can probably guess that I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm like a left progressive. People could probably guess that as my politics. If you couldn't, I'm telling you, like, it's okay. Um, but uh, uh, like, that doesn't really matter. The people who I'm in conversation with in my, in my own, and all of us on some level are in conversation with are people across political, um, the political spectrum because people are really trying to get this question right. I just got, I just got uh, hit up by a right on crime guy to, to go have some lunch and chat it up and all these things. You know, it's, it's, it's it, because, because at the end of the day, this is an American problem. It's an American problem. And so me saying that doesn't make it true in the minds of people who don't wanna hear this and who are afraid of this group. Um, and it also doesn't absolve the sins, which is a you know, bad word to use, but, but I wanna use it. It doesn't absolve the sin. People have committed crimes and most people in prison are in prison for crimes of violence. With that in mind, our question is what kind of society do we want? That's the question. And that's the place I would push. Not sugarcoating the fact that people have done bad things. People have done terrible things. Some people have done really terrible things. We can't get around it. You can't get away from it. Someone murdered somebody. Somebody sexually assaulted somebody. Somebody hurt a child, right? The question for us is what kind of society do we want? Do we want a society where even that person has a place or do we want the society that we have where there's no place for anybody in fear of that person? In fear of the worst of these, we harm the least of these, <laughs> you know? And so it's a, like, is that the society that we want? We have to ask ourselves some real soul searching questions and the answer might not be my answer. So for example, me thinking that you gotta end housing restrictions might not play well with everybody. There, there might be reasons people say, no, that's not, that's not right for me. And that's fair, it's a fair conversation to have, but we're not even having the conversation. We're not even talking about it. Law is just what it is. As if 
It's an objective thing that came from the sky on some tablets. It is not. People made these decisions. We created this monster of a, of a system that has, that has trapped half our people. We got to reckon with this. We got we got to reckon with this. Okay, it looks like we have time for a couple more questions. Thank you. <laughs> um, there's such a vast number of laws and sanctions uh, that disenfranchise the formerly incarcerated. So focusing on one big issue kind of decade, decades and decades of housing laws and uh, that you've mentioned um, that discriminate against formerly incarcerated, how can we as public health professionals uh, work to dis dismantle um, these unfair criminal justice policies specifically related to housing? And I know that you mentioned kind of fair housing, um, but what else can be done uh, that work to help maintain uh, carceral citizenship for millions of people? Yeah, I think, um, so two things that public health, is, well, one thing that public health has done been at the forefront of declaring this an American crisis. I mean, the American um, Association of Public Health called mass incarceration, uh, declared mass incarceration a public health crisis like a decade ago. You know, like long before other associations, maybe longer than that, long before other associations. Um, and, so, and so that was strong. That's a strong move and started um, pushing us to pay attention to the social determinants of things two decades before that. Um, and, so, and, so, and so the social determinants of health, um, mass incarceration as uh, a, a driver of, of, of racial health disparities, um, mass incarceration as itself a, a crisis of public health, in part because of the clustering, in part because of um, what we know mass incarceration does to people. Like we know that all the, the, the literature that I cited at the very beginning, most, much of it um, came from public health professionals. We know that people lose range of motion. We know uh, that the people die early. We know that people catch um, communicable diseases uh, in jails and prisons because of public health research. And we know, um, for example, uh, uh, that, that chronic illnesses um, uh, uh, circulate within this group, um, largely because of living conditions. We knew before COVID uh, decimated uh, so many uh, people inside jails and prisons, public health officials were ringing the alarms early. Look in the prisons, look in the prisons, look in the prisons. That's the kind of work that's necessary. That work that was done was necessary. And because of that work, we've avoided many crises. Now, now there was no national response um, to COVID in prisons. There's, there's, there's no national response to COVID. But, there, but, there, but, there's, but there's certainly no national response to COVID in prisons. Um, and, and so organizations like Just Leadership USA and others are calling for a national response um, to the public health crisis of COVID in prisons and have been doing that and have been beating that drum for months and have been meeting with legislators and helping to change the way that, that, that prisons respond to it. So things like compassionate release, they're formerly incarcerated people. They're, they're certainly our public health officials, but they're also formerly incarcerated people who are leading those pushes. And one thing I would say to all our fields, I teach in the School of Social Work, I'm speaking to a, to a, to a, to a, in a school of public health. Uh, and and, and, and I'm, a, I'm a sociologist, so I have an association too, uh, of like there's an association of, of social scientists, um, you know, so people call them, soci you know, sociolo sociologists, all, all, they're all manner of professional memberships. The thing that we need to do if we're serious about mass incarceration is invite people in to lead. So, so invite people into not just a seat at the table, but into a place where they can help lead the conversation. So inviting people with records into the discussion and allowing them to take leadership of, of the kinds of discussions we have and utilizing our tools. Public health uh, 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 folks do research, uh, we do advocacy, uh, and, and when we change uh, uh, organizational and institutional policy and we think about uh, more national frameworks for addressing problems just like the ones that, 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 that folks. So, so inviting people in to better understand the, the problems and, and, and putting our collective minds together to figure out more of a, a broader response to them. So that's general. Let's talk um, quite specific. Um, public health can think about uh, the role of hospitals in addressing the crisis. Public health can think about 
uh, the, 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 the access to medical care for the group. Public health can ask itself a very important question. Why is the death rate so high in the first two weeks after someone gets released from a jail or prison? The, 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 the research says within two weeks, uh, folks are likely to die of an overdose, 147 times more likely to die of an overdose. But so overdose is, you know, binging is, is a response, but 11 times more likely to die from any other cause than members of the general population. Within two weeks of release, people with records, people coming out of prison. That, well, this is, these are questions for public health. What infrastructure do we need to build to prevent that? And that, that's a health question. Thank you so much. Uh, this is our last question and it's, uh, it's quite an interesting question. Um, can you also speak to the role of adverse community, um, sorry, childhood experiences or community experiences as a factor themselves? leading to the intersection with the justice system. You know, for public health, this is kind of a point of intervention, uh, maybe some point uh, as a stopgap measure. Absolutely. You know, so, so, you know, we mentioned women's incarceration and that, you know, over 80% of women who were, who were incarcerated report um, having been, uh, you know, abused, sexual abuse, and over half, I think, of that group um, were, were abused as children abuses children. Um, and, so, and so we also know that com community violence, uh, which is a public health question and a public health crisis and a public health dilemma, uh, even in years when the federal government doesn't let us count things like how many people got shot, it's still a public health question. You know? <laughs> and so we know that community violence is a driver uh, and part of incarceration. So exposure to violence, kids who have been exposed to violence. So, 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 so um, we know that uh, childhood trauma and 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 and, and complex trauma. Uh, 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 are, these are all things that drive uh, incarceration rates because they tend to cluster. Now the question is, you know, is it that people who experience these things are involved in crime, or is it policing strategies target people in these who who face these conditions? So the public health question might be a question about the role of policing. Another one, yet another one. What role do police play in a given community? Does it have a, a, a dampening effect on crime rates? So, so now crime rate becomes a public health measure instead of just a measure for criminologists because crime rate is connected to violence, is connected to trauma, is connected to the health and well being of especially children. And I know like child health and maternal infant child health and well-being, like this is a, what is it? Like there's, a, there's an acronym that you all use for like this, this kind of, this grouping. Um, you know, I'm not a public health guy, forgive me, you know? <laughs> but, um, but, um, but to think about crime as a driver, like, like there's an opportunity to switch the framework to take from criminal justice practitioners, questions of incarceration, arrests. There's a really interesting set of papers from, um, Aliyasha Sewell, Sewell is her last name. And what she looks at are, are, are the mental health effects on communities after uh, incidences of police violence. Think about police violence as a public health question. And this is, so the role that police play, the role of the courts. I think this thing that I laid out tonight could be a, like this, 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 this kind of repressive apparatus that I laid out, the supervised society um, as an indicator of, of, of health and well-being it could be, I mean, I'm not saying you all should measure what I do, like that's, that's not my point, but I'm saying like all these things, to me, these are all health questions. And so, and so um, I think it's very important that, that public health take back um, questions that have been taken from you. So criminal justice practitioners, people, who are, and there's wrong with criminal justice folks, like that's all good, but their question is, how does the system run? How do we make it run more efficiently? Which might mean better in some instances. Public health is a very different question and could apply those kinds of questions. How do we enhance, improve population health and well being when we think about these questions of arrest, when we think about these questions of over incarceration, when we think about the concentration of people with felony records in a given community? You do that for employment, you, 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 do, you do that for poverty. What if we were to do that? For, for the concentration of, 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 of people with criminal records? What if we did that with, with system involvement writ large? What if we did that with the concentration of arrests, with stop and frisk? 
if we if we thought about these things as as as, as, as public health dilemmas with public health effects, then we start thinking about new kinds of interventions. But what's happened is that the experts have come in. Not public, I'm not saying public health has its own expertise, but some expert somewhere has made a decision about uh, and divvied up the pie. This is a problem for a criminologist. This is a problem for sociologists. This is a problem for public health. This is a problem for psychologists. This is a problem for economists. Um, and turn to their, their, their favorite people uh, when the crisis comes up. So economists tell me how to address population health and well-being. Well, what does an economist know about population health and well-being? Public health professionals know about population health and well-being. Economists certainly know how to count things, how to do measures. Some of them are, are wonderful health economists and can measure, but, 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 but this is your jam. So, 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 so targeting, targeting um, these issues and claiming them as public health issues will go a long way, will help us actually quite a bit. You're one of the few, public health is one of the few fields that starts from a place of justice. The question is, you start from the place of how can we improve population health and well-being? You presume that sickness is unnecessary. You presume that, 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 that disparate uh, outcomes in the general health and well-being of a population is unnecessary. That's an assumption embedded in public health and that there's something that can be done. That's a beautiful place. And so I, I say, use it. I say, use it. Thank you, Dr. Miller. This is quite an inspiration. And I, I also feel like it is a call to all of our public health practitioners to really reframe how we think about public health um, and the latitude that we can have to solve the problems um, um, in public health and in population health in general. So again, we really appreciate you taking out your time and also uh, spending time on Chicago time, two hey. hours later uh, out of your evening to chat with us, to inform us, to uh, spend time educating us on this really important issue that is um, a human issue, a social justice issue, an American issue. Um, that must be addressed. So again, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's been my, my great pleasure to be with you tonight. Take care, everyone.